your worship, just so you know that. Please go around and spread some joy as you welcome each other this morning. chillier than normal, or what we're accustomed to in the last few weeks, but that's okay. That's okay. In case you didn't know, today is Happy Grandparents Day. So Happy Grandparent Day to every grandparent there is in the room. I'd ask you all to stand, but it'd probably be easier to have all the non-grandparents stand, right? <laughs> yeah. But Happy Grandparents Day, enjoy your day. All of you grandkids, make sure you're taking care of your grandparents today, just like you take care of mom and dad on mom and dad's day. Tonight at six o'clock is prayer, praise, and seek time. Don't forget the church is open for prayer Sunday mornings from 7 to 8.30 as well. Today is the last day to sign up for your lasagna dinner. And I know we have more meals left because there are blank lines on the sign-up sheet out in the foyer. So if you didn't put your name on the sign-up sheet yet, make sure you get your name on the sign-up sheet for the lasagna dinner next week. Uh, it comes with a complimentary nap afterwards. All the carbs you take in, you get a nice Sunday afternoon nap next week to go with it. How's that? <laughs> but just a quick reminder, we're, we are doing this fundraiser for not only for our NISOM trip, which is, like I said last week, almost completely paid for, uh, but we're also going to use that to help cover our costs this spring when we uh, host Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames in April as well. So make sure that you uh, sign up for a free, basically, a free cooked, no labor, in, no labor involved lasagna dinner for next week. Wednesday night, we're going to continue our series on respectable sins. Um, we spent last Wednesday night uh, on one topic, of pro the topic of pride, and I know we're going to cover it again this week as well. So if you feel like that's something that you need to work on, we invite you to be part of Wednesday night's uh, study on respectable sins. This Saturday is Men's Breakfast at Mandy Joe's at 8 o'clock. So guys, put that on your calendar if you don't have it there already. And did I mention next Sunday there's a lasagna dinner? I'm just, <laughs> just, just making sure I cover all my bases, okay? But don't forget, after the morning service next week, you'll pick up your meal. Uh, next week is also the Teenager Cookie Bake, so if you have signed up or need to sign up to bring in cookies, please do so. Also, if you have anybody uh, that is far from the area who could use a gift care package, uh, from the teenagers, please get that address into the office as well. The 20th and 21st is Ladies' Night Out on the Farm. Uh, we were told to add, bring your lawn chairs because nobody wants to sit on the on the bare ground. So make sure you bring your lawn chairs with you. I guess there's going to be some time outside, maybe around the campfire, uh, and 
spending some time together and ministering with each other. The 21st is home groups at Joel and Don Zimmerman's. Uh, we're going to continue our study on the cost of control. And in two weeks, uh, two Sundays, we will have John Jacobs' Next Generation Power Course here, both in the morning and the evening service. Uh, there's, I think there's still flyers out in the foyer. Uh, get those, get some, and hand them out to your friends, your neighbors, or post them up on community bulletin boards, help get the word out uh, so that we can bring more people in on both of those services. On the 29th, the last Sunday of the month, we're going to have an ushers, greeter, and security team training, refresher training, uh, just to get everybody uh, refreshed and on the same page as far as what we expect, uh, uh, what we need you to do when you're an usher, or greeter, or part of the security team as well. And I have one final announcement that Sandy's going to make. <laughs> Shock here. No. <laughs> Suzette and Sandy uh, would like to talk a little bit about Operation Christmas Child. They were there uh, yesterday at uh, the meeting. And don't forget, September is outfits, t-shirts, and dresses. So I'm just going to hand the mic over. To Suzette. To Suzette. Or to Sandy. <laughs> So we just wanted to share a little bit. Uh, we are not the project coordinators, and, but the others couldn't go, so we were the substitute of people that went. Uh, there were 45 churches represented, um, and we, it was held at the, um, not the Nazarene church, the, I can't think of it, it's Cross from Hokies. Hokie G's, it was Cross from Hokie G's. Hokie G's church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Christian Missionary Alliance, yes. So um, we just... We got a lot of good information. It was very uh, encouraging. We wanted to share that with you. Um, and a lot of the testimonies from the shoeboxes, how God is using just a simple shoebox to win souls um, for the kingdom. And that's the whole purpose behind the shoebox. You know, it's not in the quantity that we do here, um, but it's in, you know, uh, putting that uh, personal touch on the box. And they talked a lot about putting the personalized touch on every box. Um, so if you haven't uh, brought in donations yet, that's still not, um, there's still time to do that. And also you can be looking for things that you want. They talked about making the boxes fun, uh, filled, what was it, fun, filled, and personalized. So that when the, when the kids open the box, you know, there's something, the wow factor. Um, so if you have not brought anything in and you want to be involved with this, it's not too late. Um, they're going to uh, have a packing party, right, Sid? We haven't set the date yet, but a packing party where the kids can come and participate. But if you um, like to shop on your own, you know, go ahead and do that. Just bring your items to the packing party. You know, enjoy the fellowship. And, um, you know, it's just awesome what God is doing. And like, we, like they were emphasizing, the whole point of the shoebox is to win souls for the kingdom. And... Um, they, they put in um, the boxes um, these little flyers. What I don't think they put them they, they give them. So which, oh, here, each, I'll let her talk. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to talk a little bit. So, so with each shoebox that they give out, they actually give this little um, brochure that comes with it. And then the $10 that goes towards the box, I, the box, I always thought went towards shipping. But that's not the case. They actually do a discipleship program. So each kid who gets an Operation shoe, Christmas Child shoebox, to get um, enrolled in this like 12 week discipleship program where they do this curriculum and at the end they get a new testament in their own language so i just liked that idea that that ten dollars isn't just for the shipping for the box but it's actually discipling these children to go out and reach the other family members and villagers with you know the word of god mm. I, as they were talking, I thought about this story Dawn told us about, you know, how they worked, uh, a group went down and, and worked through the processing line and they found a box. They opened the box, double checked it for things that shouldn't be in there. And here was a box, the story of a box full of socks. Nothing but white socks. And they're like, no, leave the box alone. That was the way it was intended to be put together. And here that box ended up in a kid's hands who was just, uh, went through a burn situation, had burns on, and scars on his arms and needed those socks to cover the bad ones. So that just shows you God works in mysterious. God's in control. Irregardless of what we think, God is in control, right? 
Amen. If the ushers would come, we will receive your morning tithes and offerings. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you again for this day. Another day that we can come into your house, Lord. Lord, humbly come into your house. Knowing that we need to check our pride each and every day, each and every moment of each and every day, Lord, knowing that you're in control, not, not us. That you are the one who has laid out the plans, Lord, and it's just and we need to be able to humble ourselves and follow what you've laid out for us. Lord, we ask that you bless these tithes and offerings as each are about to give. Lord, you know each person's needs. We just ask that you meet them. Lord, so that they can just realize that, again, that you're in control and it's all up to you. We give you the glory and honor. Lord, we just ask that you bless the, the worship as we're about to enter, Lord, and lay these songs on the worship team's hearts to help prepare us for the word that you've laid on the pastor's heart. Lord, that will help us grow. Lord, and help us be the clay that you, the potter, will mold into your image. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We give you all the glory and all the honor. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Please stand and use this time to open up your heart to the Lord and say, do what you want to do, Lord.
worship him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for being a holy God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy are you, Lord. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of all honor today. You're worthy to be praised and glorified. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Holy, holy forever. Lord, we know that you're holy. And you're worthy of all praise and honor today. But Lord, we need to be holy. We need to be separate from this world. That we would be holy for you. For your glory and for your honor. Make us holy, God. Make us pure in you today. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, I pray today that we as your people would separate ourselves from this world. That we would find ourselves worshiping you alone. And only you, not the things of this world, not other people, but Lord, that we would worship you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our might, with all of our strength, God, that we would worship you, the one who heals, the one who restores, the one who strengthens, the one who encourages, the one who leads and guides us. The one who is our very life, our very breath that we breathe today is because of your love, because of your great creation, Lord. Hallelujah. We owe you our life today. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, today, we're so grateful for all that you've done in our life to this point, you brought us here at Everett Assembly of God this morning. You brought us together today for a reason, for a purpose. There's a plan for every one of us that are here this morning. There is a plan that you have designed that we might hear from you, that we might be led of you, and that you might ultimately be glorified as a result of what we hear today, what we receive today in the house of the Lord. Lord, be glorified through our life. Be praised. And remind us when we leave here today, Lord, that we don't just go about our business doing what we want, but we go about our Father's business. And we do that which you've called us to do. Lord, we're asking for your wisdom and your guidance and your direction. May you be praised. Hallelujah. Praise God. Can you say amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Give somebody a hug before you're seated. Welcome to God's house. Thank you for being here today. We're honored. We're honored. If you're visiting with us, thank you so much for being here. What a privilege to have guests today. Isn't that awesome? Thank you for being a part of our worship service. And if you have a card that you filled out, I hope you filled out that card because before you leave, we have a special gift for you. And we pray that you will be back to with us together in God's house. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. We're going to ask the kids to go. Guys, have a great time. Enjoy your time together. In two weeks, we're going to be having John Jacobs with us. Um, I need to just remind you, get on your phones, send a text message, or send a message, get on your computer, send a message to your friends. I've been inviting a lot of people. I've invited some teachers. I've invited um, some kids. I'll keep pushing it, keep inviting people to come. 
um, for that great event that we're going to be sharing in a couple of weeks. Praise God. We're going to fill this place up, right? Amen. How many of you like the parking lot? Doesn't that look nice? Yes. Yeah, it looks great. More places to park. And I noticed that some of you are taking advantage of the new parking lot and using those lines so people can that come later can come closer to the building. Thank you for doing that. That's great. Praise the Lord. Well, open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 18 and Revelation chapter 3. Put your finger in both of those. We're not going to read them. We're going to read them during the message, in the message. And I'm going to continue on the, the same vein I was in last week. We're going to talk about fire. Last week, we talked to you about keeping that fire burning. We're going to continue to do that. Only we're going to give you some more ways that you can keep that fire burning uh, that's shown to us in the New Testament. But today, I want to talk to you about what I call Holy Spirit, light my fire. Holy Spirit, light my fire. I hope and pray that's your desire today. But we're going to begin in, uh, in our message. Halfway through the message, we'll be sharing... Um, some scriptures out of 1 Kings chapter 18, and then we'll be going to Revelation chapter uh, 3 later on. Okay, so let's ask God's blessing on his word. Praise the Lord. Father, you've already blessed this service. You've already blessed our lives. The Lord, your word has already been blessed. But we need, Lord, to ask that you would help us to receive Receive the blessing you have for us today in God's house. What an honor it is to be here together, fellowshipping and precious like faith. But Lord, we're asking that when we leave here today, that we will take with us the word of God. Your truth, Lord, would penetrate our spirits and we would receive it not only by hearing it, but we would receive it by demonstrating it in our life this week. May you be praised, and we pray this Amen. in Jesus' name. And everyone said again, Amen. 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 What is the meaning of this quote by Terry Pratchett? Terry Pratchett says, Give a man a fire, and he's warm for the day. But set a fire to him, and he's warm for the rest of his life. What do you think about that quote? I understand the first part of that sentence pretty clear. It says that if you give anybody a torch and they light a fire, or give them some wood to burn and they light a fire, that uh, they might understand that for a limited time, they're going to be made warm, maybe for a few hours, maybe for a day, but you have to keep feeding that fire. But what does he mean by set fire to him? What does that mean? Set fire to a person, right? God chose fire to be a symbol of of his presence and it's God's desire that we stay in his presence by the way all the time all the time it's not his will that we get fired up and then we lose the fire although all of us have done that obviously including myself there's times I'm on fire times I lose that sense of fire and we read the presence of fire all through the Bible it's everywhere when Moses met the presence of God in the desert, it was in the form of a what? A burning bush. And when the people of Israel confronted the presence of God in Mount Sinai, on that mountain was on fire. And when Solomon dedicated the temple, it says, the glory of the Lord fell and fire fell from heaven. When Ezekiel has his vision in Ezekiel chapter 21, he saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it full of what? Fire. Fire. In the law of Moses, God said to the priests, which we talked about last week, if you remember in Leviticus, don't ever let the fire on the altar go out. It must burn continually. John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but there is on Coming after me, one who is mightier than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. 
with fire. So in fact, Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 12, verse 45, I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Those are the words of Jesus. Our prayer as believers should be, Holy Spirit, light my fire. Amen. Holy Spirit, light my fire. And throughout history, revival has always been associated with fire. To ask God for revival is to pray for the fire of heaven to break out. And no one knew how to start a fire like Elijah. I mean, he's going to look at one man here who started a revival through a prayer. It was unbelievable in the northern kingdom of Israel. The northern kingdom had 19 kings. And the Bible says that every one of those kings were wicked. Every one of them. But ironically, this single revival that took place during the reign of Ahab, who was the greatest of the wicked, he was the most wicked king of all. And yet God chose to have a revival during his reign. I think that's amazing. And the fire from heaven came down and Elijah, God appears and proves to us how he can light a spiritual fire in the middle of a wicked world. Don't you think if God can do it in the Old Testament under Elijah, he can do it today in the United States of America where we have great wickedness happening. It's worse than it's ever been. But I still believe that God wants to send a revival. Amen. I believe that. So however it is one, one nation under God, God wants to bring us back to himself and we need to understand that there is a way back to God through a spirit of revival if we just willing to let the Holy Spirit light our fire. Amen. So let me ask you this question. How do we light a spiritual fire? How do we light it? Elijah says in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, as the Lord of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Isn't that ironic? Why would he say that? Because lighting a spiritual fire calls for hard praying. This is exactly what Elijah is doing. He's praying a hard prayer. After saying this, Elijah had to go into hiding. You know why? Because Ahab was furious and he sent his soldiers out everywhere looking for him, even in foreign countries, and they could not find him. He wanted to kill him like he killed all the other prophets and he caught up with them and killed them. But God would not let him take Elijah's life. And during that time, Elijah wasn't just hiding. The Bible tells us he was praying. He was praying. So for three and a half years, Elijah prayed that it would not rain in Israel. Now, can you imagine praying that kind of prayer, asking God for some calamity to fall on his people? It had to have been a pain for Elijah to pray that prayer. Just think of what it was asking for. He's asking for drought. He's asking for famine. He's asking for devastation. People's lives will be taken. The people he loved. But he was willing to ask for physical famine if it would put an end to the spiritual famine in Israel. I want you to please think about that this morning. Elijah's prayer was necessary. If the plague of sin was to be wiped out, and if they were to really survive, they were forced to get rid of their sins. So I, Elijah had to pray this prayer. He had to pray a necessary prayer to bring calamity on them. Revival fire breaks out when someone is so burdened and so grieved in their spirit at the rebellion against God, they're willing to pray these hard prayers, asking God to drive God's people back to him. Amen. We need to pray those kinds of prayers. 
There comes a time when godly people need to ask God to bring calamity upon the ungodly in order to bring them out of their ungodliness back to God. People don't want to hear that. We need to pray those prayers. God, put judgment on. God, do something, whatever it takes to get them back to God. Amen. There are some people who need to become so miserable in their sins, so crushed by its weight, that the only option they have is to come back to God. Yes. We need to pray those prayers. They're hard to pray. That's the only way that they will ever make a move toward God when they cannot stand the torture of their own sins of what it brings to their life. That's exactly what Elijah prayed for, and that is what we got, he got God's answer to prayer. And if God answered Elijah's prayer, he's going to answer our prayer so long as it's offered in the same spirit. Amen. The issue is not if we can pray like Elijah. The issue is if we are burdened enough and spiritually brave enough to pray that kind of prayer. Are we brave enough to pray that kind of prayer? Your way with children, whether they're kids or whether they're adults, your kids are not serving God, we need to pray these kinds of prayers that God will convict them, that whatever it takes, I'm convinced there are situations in our families that will only be fixed when we're willing to let go and love them, not hang on to them. Let God have them. Give, give them over to God. He will do that which is right and perfect and bring them back to himself. Amen. But we need to pray the tough prayers. Yes. They're hard to pray. I have to pray those prayers myself. I'm not telling you anything different that I don't do already in my own home, in my own life. I release my sons in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, light my fire that you might light theirs. Amen. Yes, amen. Praise God. <laughs> Secondly, lighting a spiritual fire calls for hard preaching. Wow. After three years, when the family was great, Elijah came back to Israel and sent Obadiah to fetch King Ahab. I want you to go with me to 1 Kings chapter 18. Look at verses 18 to 21. 18 to 21. I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, who you, your father's family, have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now, some of the people from all over Israel and meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So they have sent word without all Israel and assembled prophets on Mount Carmel. Wow. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Wow. They said absolutely nothing after, a after Elijah said that. They said absolutely nothing. Because they didn't like to hear what the preacher had to say. They didn't like what he was saying. They didn't want to hear it. They say nothing because you see, Elijah had called all the people together. They demanded that they make a decision. Who are you going to follow? How long will you waver between the two, the gods? The word waver is the very same Hebrew word that's actually used also in verse 26 about the prophets of Baal dancing around the altar. Dancing. So what Elijah is saying is, how long are you going to dance with Baal? How long are you going to dance with the true God? One moment you're dancing with Baal, the next moment you're dancing with the true living God. All you're doing is dancing to whomever you think you're going to gain the most from. And they didn't like that. They didn't like it. So how? You know what I'm talking about. Because we hear it in America. Just start preaching about how God is inseparable from Christians' businesses, practices, politics. Let me tell you something. We need more Christians in politics. Amen. We need more believers to get involved with the right things. Our social ethics 
preach about abortion and homosexuality and, and lotteries. I don't buy lottery tickets. I hope you don't either. That's gambling. I'm sorry. I'm old fashioned. I don't believe in that. I believe we need to, we're jeopardizing our, our walk with the Lord when we're taking chances like that. Preach about needing to repent about sin, yes. not preaching about apologizing for my sin, but repenting for my sin. Amen. Amen. There was an old time preacher named Peter Cartwright who was famous for telling like it is. He was preaching near Washington, D.C. And the people of the church heard that President Andrew Jackson was coming to the service. And so they pulled Mr. Cartwright aside and said, now listen, Peter, the president is coming and we want to make sure that he don't speak any offensive words. Be careful, weigh your words out. So Peter got up in the pulpit the next Sunday and his first three sentences were these. I understand that President of the United States, Andrew Jackson, is with us this morning. I've been asked to be guarded in my remarks, but Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he doesn't repent. <laughs> and the whole congregation was mad at him. Telling it like it is. At the end of the service, Andrew Jackson grabs his hand and he looks at Mr. Cartwright and he says, man, I wish I had more preachers like you. And here's his comment. He says, sir, if I had a regiment of men like you, I would whip the world. <laughs> Praise God. Tell it like it is. Right? Revival. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage. Notice the three kinds of preaching there. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. Which is the most popular? Yeah. <laughs> popular preachers tell people they're everything they want to hear. People who preach for revival will tell people they need to get right with God. The issue is not if a man can still preach like Elijah. The issue is if anyone's going to let them because become um, dancers between the one or the two, then you've got to call a spade a spade. Amen. Yes. You've got to call sin, sin. And we can't waver between the two opinions. Revival fire calls for what? Hard preaching. Yes. Here's the third thing. Lighting of fire, spiritual fire, calls for hard prescriptions. I want you to go back to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to read a number of scriptures here, verses 22 to 40. I want you to get this story. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them cho chose one for themselves and then cut it into pieces and put on the wood, but not set a fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set a fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And then all the people said, what you say is good. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. And since there are so many of you, call in the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. And then they called on the name of the of Baal from morning until noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar and they made. At noon, at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Imagine, Elijah's boy, he's getting pretty serious here. Shout louder. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or he's busy traveling. Maybe he's sleeping. He must be awakened. And so they shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears as their custom until the blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time of the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. And then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and they repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. And Elijah took 12 stones, 
one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, and large enough to hold two seahs of seed. And he arranged the wood, cut and the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. And then he said to them, Fill your large jars with water, and pour on the offering on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, and he ordered, and they did it the third time. And the water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are the God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. That's all he prayed. That's all he prayed. Listen to this. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and he burned up the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the soil. Also, he licked up the water in the trench. Wow, he even put water on it, and it still went into the fire. And when the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to Kishon Valley and slaughtered them there. Praise God. That's when the revival started. Amen. He prayed a simple prayer. Oh, God, it's amazing. I mean, was he being a little cruel here? Kind of like badgering these people a little bit? Did he have to do that? Did he have to go that far? I don't know. Did he have to be that ridiculous but I mean come on you're slaughtering your 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 bales I mean you're, you're just you're not doing a thing here he's obeying God's word Amen. and it's always radical when you obey God's word Amen. in Exodus twenty two twenty, whoever sacrifices to any God other than the Lord must be utterly destroyed that's exactly what Elijah did. He obeyed the word of God. Amen. And it's radical to obey God's word in a society where humanism reigns. The idea of every person can decide what's right and wrong for him. And listen, we need revival fire. Somebody say amen. We need it now. And it depends on getting rid of that which displeases God. And sometimes that is a bitter pill to swallow. Would you thank the surgeon for not being cruel and just remove part of your cancer? Do you think it would be too radical to lock up all the drug dealers and the rapists and the pedophilers and the murderers or just let most of them walk on the street? Just as we would want all of the cancer to be gone and all the murderers and the rapists and the drug dealers removed from the streets, we ought to want our sin taken from our lives Listen, and appear holy before God. Amen. We must take a radical action in our lives if we want to have a revival fire of God burning deep inside of us. I grew up in the 50s and 60s. And I'll be honest with you, they were some good times. But there was a man in the 50s by the name of Roy Cook. He wanted to be a minister of the gospel. He felt called to ministry. A young teenager at that time, the Korean conflict was coming up and all the boys in school were, were signing up to go into the military and fight for their country. But he signed up and enrolled in the Minnesota Bible College because he's gonna be a pastor. And they got wind and they got word that he signed up for a different army. And he knew they'd be upset, so he went down to the local gas station, which in those days, that's where you hung out at. Not at Sheets. Or what, they hang out at Sheets anymore? I don't know. I'm in and out so quick. But they, they don't hang out, you know, they hang out at the gas station. And he gets out of his car, and he sees they're already talking about him, and they're calling him Chicken Roy. Chicken Roy, Chicken Roy, you won't join the army. You're Chicken Roy, you're afraid to fight for your nation. 
And he gets out of the car, pretty big guy, about two, about six foot two. He's standing there, he puts his finger in his friend's face and says, I want to tell you something right now. Walked up, he said, listen, I just signed up for the army. You don't have guts to join. When you got saved, you signed up for an army that people don't have guts to join because it takes it takes faith, it takes strength, Amen. it takes Amen. power, it takes hard preaching. It's a prescription. We have to go obey the word of God. Amen. When he says go, you go. Yes. Come on. Amen. I've had families who literally their sons and their daughters were called to ministry. I'm thinking of one family in particular. Sons and daughters called to ministry and the parents wouldn't let them go. Wouldn't let go of them. Wouldn't let go of them. Well, we, we need them here. We need them here. You know, if God calls you, you've got to go. You gotta go. So it's one thing to get a fire started, but it's another thing to maintain it. And we talked about that last week, but I want to add some this week from the New Testament. I want you to turn to Revelation, if you would please. Revelation chapter 3. How can we keep the spiritual fire burning then? I'm going to read to you verses 14 to 22. The angel of the church in Laodicea writes, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spew you, many translations, spit, this will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich in white <clears throat> clothes to wear so that you can cover your shame, nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Now, one of the greatest strategies in America, in our churches, is this idea of a whole home Christianity. Ho hum. Just kind of walk through their Christian walk, just kind of lazy. There are seven churches in Asia Minor that would we would call now modern day Turkey. The Lord gave a message to each of these churches, and the same message. And each one of them, prophetically, he gave each church a prophetic message, and they show us collectively their past and their future. If you do a study on these churches, he always shows them where they've come from and where they need to go and what, how they can solve it. So in my opinion, there's no problem in the local church that all these seven churches that he speaks about in Revelation are actually demonstrated in the churches we have today. I believe God is addressing the local body, the local church in America, in our world. But God's asking each one of these churches, are you listening? And he says, he has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. These seven churches speak to you personally, and God is going to hold every one of us personally responsible for the truth that we hear. So in chapter 1, Jesus is shown standing in the midst of the seven candlesticks, which are the seven churches. But in, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus taught, where two or three are gathered in your name, there he's in the midst of them. He's in the midst of the churches, the seven candlesticks representing those churches. Jesus is closer to you than your neighbor is right now. Would you actually find it difficult to pay attention to Jesus if he were sitting next to you? But he is, he is in you. He is next to you. He is next to me. And it's extremely important we hear this word. Because we have Jesus sitting next to us, and we at times still lose the fire. 
Out of the seven churches, the one in Laodicea sticks out the most to me because it was lukewarm. It's impossible to have a spiritual fire when you're lukewarm. It's this church that teaches us how do we keep our fire burning. Let me give you three things quickly. We need to realize the curse of a lukewarm Christianity. Look at verses 15 and 16 as I speak. It is the Greek term that means to vomit. When he says spit out, many translations, I think it's a better translation, is to vomit you, vomit you out of God's mouth. There is a sin that makes God sick to his stomach, and it's the sin of lukewarmness. Lukewarmness is a little too cold to be hot, a little too hot to be cold, a little too hot to freeze, and too cold to boil. And so God's not speaking to the atheist. God's not speaking to the person who hates God. God's not speaking to the agnostic. God's not speaking to them. God's speaking to the church. He's speaking to God's, his people, the Christians. He's speaking to lukewarm Christians. <laughs> Lukewarmness is manifested in so many, many ways. But I'm going to stick my neck out today and give you a number of things that I think are the sign of lukewarmness. Do you have a burning desire to be as holy as a sinner can be? Do you burn within you to be holy? Mark 7, 6, Jesus said their hearts were far from him. Is your heart far from God? Let me ask you, you may not commit adultery, but do you watch programs that entertain adultery? You may not steal, but do you pay your debts? Are you self-centered? Do you think the world evolves around everything you do? Do you go through worship services without a passion for Christ? We are to sing with a passion before the Lord. The most important thing is to not the pitch, but it's the priority of the heart. Amen. I'm saying this to you. Do you have a hunger for the word? The average Christian doesn't even have a quiet time with God. When was the last time you were really hungry to learn something from the Word of God? When was the last time that you fasted and prayed and you wanted to learn something so that your faith would grow and mature? The average Christian doesn't spend only but a few minutes in intercession a day. And when was the last time that, that we actually would sacrifice more than just, just the same old thing every single day? Let me tell you, we are lukewarm about soul winning. I've struggled over the years in my own life with soul winning. That's why I always, we taught it here on how many times, so many times, and we wait for a special class to happen. Don't wait for a special class. I haven't been to college. I don't know those things. I think, yes, you do. Those are excuses. You can share the gospel. If Jesus lives in you, you can share the gospel. You know who he is, and you know who he is in you. Amen. So we just, so we don't bother, because we're afraid of things. That's the enemy in us. God would rather have us out and out against him than pretending that we love him. The lukewarm Christian is the alibi for sinners. God would rather have you on the wrong side of the fence than straddling the fence. Campbell Morgan said, War lukewarmness is the worst kind of blasphemy. Lukewarmness says, Jesus, I believe in you, but you do not excite me. Why is lukewarmness so bad? It's bad because it sets you up for other sins. It becomes so lukewarm that we're cursed with having our human sinful nature take control of our life again. That's when Christians begin to criticize instead of complimenting and criticizing people and saying things that they shouldn't be saying. God is not, God's not pleased when we criticize. We need to concern and build people up and strengthen them. Amen. And if you're more critical of other people rather than compassion towards them, then guess what? You've got the curse of lukewarmness. In my opinion, you should be encouraging people, which most of you guys do, I know. But lukewarmness has been an, an age-old problem 
It has been per, it is preceded by revival, and revival has preceded lukewarmness. We have example after example in the Word of God. Lukewarmness, spirit, revival, fires that come and they go. Lukewarmness is a curse to our nation. It is a curse to our families. Amen. I could say so much more, but let me explain it this way. Every year, between sixty thousand and two hundred thousand people will die from a medical condition known as deep vein thromboids. I think is how you pronounce it. It's called DVT. Usually DVT occurs as a person's legs and their blood clots that form. The danger is that the clot might circulate and go to the lungs or cause a stroke or respiratory issue. These clots are not caused by irregular behavior. They're simply caused by inactivity. Simply sitting or laying around, <laughs> clots form. So there are sins of commission and there are sins of omission. And when we blatantly do those things that God forbids, well, somehow, we, you know, we take it serious. God forbids that I do this. But because of sins of omission, that's subtle. We tend to think of them as being more benign. Nevertheless, sometimes it's the person who lays around and does nothing who faces the gravest danger. See, that's what the enemy wants to make us lukewarm. And then we build these spiritual clots. <laughs> Yeah. And we wonder why we're having spiritual strokes. <laughs> Hear me. I say this in love. Christians, I love you with all my heart. But some families are committing the sin of omission. They're lazy with their Christian responsibilities. And they're cursing the next generation. Ouch. Ouch. Be careful. It's a curse. It's a curse. Number two, we need to remember the cause of lukewarm Christianity. Verses 17 and 18, please note the mentality and the materialism. They need to know. There's two phrases in there I see that are important. You say and you know. You see those phrases? Their indifference was caused by their ignorance. They did not know what their need was. Here's the problem. The greatest need was to see their need. They didn't see it. The lukewarm Christian doesn't see it. It's everybody else that's lukewarm. Wow. So how does a person reach the place in his life? A person that cools down to different degrees. How does that happen? The seven churches show us how a person or people cooled down one degree at a time. Every one of these churches cooled off. Each church was given a warning, as I told you early, and the area of weakness they possessed in their church. And if they did not correct it and they did not repent, they were spiritually dying. So they lose their fire and the spirit would not strive with them. Every single church. Was there ever been a time when you loved Jesus more than you love him now? If so, you're one degree away from, you're starting to backslide. You don't love him more than you use him. You gotta, you're, you're going the other way. You're either going forward or you're going backward. And if you don't repent, you're going to eventually be in room temperature. I'm convinced that pride keeps us from admitting we have an area of weakness or that we really don't need to change anything in our relationship. We spent a whole hour Wednesday night on a subject that I thought would only take me about 20, 15, 20 minutes talking about pride. I, I was working some stuff out and I didn't even get to our regular outline, so we're going to talk about pride again this week. But see, this is where this is a huge area. It's a huge problem. It doesn't matter how you grade your sin. If you do not admit you have sin, you can't fix the problem. Amen. Amen. So it's like a man who was, has a deadly disease. 
He's discomfort. He has discomfort. He's in a lot of pain. He doesn't feel good. I'm not going to the doctors. I don't want the doctors to tell me and examine me that I'm going to die. So he therefore he believes, oh, I don't have to be told. I don't have to be doing anything. That's what Christians do. They do. Well, you know, don't tell me. I don't really want to know. I'll just stay away. I'll stay away from church. Stay away from any learning experiences. Therefore, we won't we won't have any problems, right? I won't have to face anything. And since he refuses to see a doctor, he's unable to get the source of the problem. So, you know, what happens? He can't fix what's wrong in his life. And the same problem with sin. God is the doctor and sin is the disease. And unless we give our sin sick souls to the Lord, we're going to die in our sins. And the word sin, what's the middle letter in the word sin? I. I. It's not pastor's fault. It's not somebody else's fault. It's not the church's fault. It's not your mom's fault, your dad's fault. It's not your kid's fault. It's my fault. My fault, my guilt, my shame. And finally, we need to recommit to the cure of lukewarm Christianity. Look at verse 18. The word gold, talking about the gold of God's glory. They needed gold that had been, that had been through the fire. So you add up everything you have, the money can't buy, and death can't take away, and you have what? Your true wealth. You need the garments of God's righteousness. They thought they were clothed, but they came naked. The white, white clothing speaks of righteousness. We need the grace to see what God sees in our lives. We need to pray that God will open our eyes. God has summed it up when he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Be zealous for the Lord. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart. Therefore, to me, the greatest sin is not to love God with all your heart. It's to be partially surrendering your life. But to hear God's voice, you need to confess our sins. We have so many problems in our world. We need to get rid of. We need to. We need to get rid of our own selfish spirits and self righteousness. And I could say some other things, but I need to save some time and close out. Holman Hunt completed a famous picture showing Christ standing outside a closed door. In fact, I can see the picture in my own eyes. One of the churches my dad pastored up in Cory, Pennsylvania, when I was a child, had a picture in the front of the church. And Jesus is standing at the door and he's knocking. And the artist, another artist came by and says, you have a problem. You don't, there's no latch on that door. How are you going to get in the door? And the artist told him very clearly, Mr. Hunt said, well, what, what? it's purposely done that way. Why? Because a person that's on the inside needs to open up the door. So Jesus can come. Amen. That was the purpose. The only way you can get in through that door is repentance. Yes. How do we light a spiritual fire? And how do we keep it burning? The only way you're going to set a fire of revival in our lives and in our nation, if we're willing to pay the price like Elijah did, pray the hard prayers. Be bold and proclaim the word of God. Radical obedience. And if we're going to be able to maintain the fire, then we've got to realize the curse of lukewarmness. Remember the cause of lukewarmness and recommit to the cure of lukewarmness. That's what we need. If we want to see true revival in America, we Christians need to get on fire. Holy Spirit, Amen. light my fire. Praise God. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, today that we can speak about your truths. And sometimes we need to speak them boldly. And sometimes we just need to blurt it out, the truth. And we did some of that today. But Lord, I pray that we at Everett Assembly of God, Lord, 
Set us on fire. Set us on fire, God. Help us, Lord, not to be lukewarm. If, if I'm lukewarm in any area of my life, God, set me on fire for the glory of God, that I might be more effective and a greater witness for you, that others might catch that fire for the glory of God. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand, please? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God's so good, isn't he? He's faithful. And as you sing this song, just give it to the Lord. Honor him today. Ask him to light your fire, to move you, and to, to bless you in a way that he's never blessed you before. God has special blessings for those who obey. Right? Amen. Amen. Let's obey his word. Let's sing it together. Thank you, Lord. Yes.
that's our prayer, Lord. We want more. More of your love, more of your power, more of your wisdom, more of your life. We need you, God. So, Lord, when we leave here today, God, hear our hearts cry. Hear the desire of our heart. We want to serve you greater than ever before. We want to give you every kingdom of our heart, every part of our life. God, I pray that you'll set us on fire this week. Lord, that we'll know that truly a fire has started. And Lord, that we will keep that fire burning for your glory and honor. Bless your people. Bless our families, Lord. Strengthen them, encourage them, sustain them. God, I pray as they worship you, as they love on you, God, that you will pour out your blessing upon them. Jesus, be glorified in the lives that we live. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. God bless you.